A very good evening to all of you. Welcome to today's talk, Net Zero is Not Enough, with Sisi Zhang Harada and Sarah Ichioka. So this program is a part of the inaugural Art Science Residency and is a community event of Singapore Design Week. It is lovely having all of you here with us today. My name is Joshua. I'm a production and curatorial specialist here at Art Science Museum, and I'll be your MC for this evening. So before we begin, I would just like to inform everyone of a few housekeeping matters. The washrooms are through the white doors of the VR gallery, so that's on the other side of the floor. You will just have to exit the cinema that way. Um, in the event of a fire or an emergency, please do remain calm and listen out for the announcements over the PA system. If we do need to proceed to an emergency assembly area, that would be underneath the Bayfront Bridge. And last but not least, please note that all food and drinks are not allowed in this premises. So without further ado, I would like to invite Orna Hager, Vice President of Art Science Museum and Attractions at Marina Bay Sands, up on stage to give an introduction to this evening's program. Thank you, Joshua. Welcome to Art Science Museum, everyone. Tonight's event brings together two change makers within the space of design, innovation, and sustainability, Cesar Jung Harada and Sarah Ichioka. The designer wields great influence on our cultural and political landscape, serving to manifest often revolutionary ideas. With such responsibility, what mindsets could designers adopt when looking towards a future defined by multiple environmental challenges? Tonight, both Caesar and Sarah will attempt to answer this question as they introduce new approaches such as regenerative design. Both of them are passionate about how design can make a better future, a more sustainable future, something we care deeply about here at Art Science Museum too. Tonight's event launches our program for Singapore Design Week, which began earlier this week and runs until the 1st of October. The centerpiece of our Design Week program is a showcase in our Level 3 gallery, Ocean Imagineer Work Studio. This small exhibition documents the residency that Caesar has been doing with us at Art Science Museum this year. Caesar is our inaugural art scientist in residence, and in that capacity has been bringing his passion for the ocean into the museum through a series of workshops, hackathons, talks, and education activities that have engaged literally thousands of visitors in design innovation. Caesar's practice uses the forces of nature as he invents creative remedies for man-made problems. He believes that ocean currents, the wind, and other naturally occurring phenomena can provide inspiration and novel solutions to environmental issues. He draws on citizen science, design, art, and open hardware to create innovative ocean technologies. And many of these technologies are on show downstairs in the Ocean Imagineer work studio. We've literally brought Caesar's studio into the galleries, and that enables our visitors to have a unique opportunity to see behind the scenes into his creative process. We're showing his materials, tools, prototypes, models, and the early seeds of new ideas. Showing the process of creation rather than the finished product is new for us at Art Science Museum, and it's in keeping with the open and participatory nature of Caesar's work. He's always looking for ways to draw people into the process of making, co-creating solutions for today's environmental challenges. Shortly, you're going to be hearing from Caesar on what inspires him and what has driven him to act with such passion and urgency for the environment. His talk will be followed by a presentation from urbanist, writer, and curator, Sarah Ichioka, who is one of Singapore's preeminent thought leaders in the space of regenerative design. Their talks kick off a weekend of activity focused on the Ocean Imagineer Work Studio. Tomorrow, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., Caesar Harada and his father, the artist Tetsuo Harada, um, will be engaged in a situational performance in the studio. 
Using the tools and materials on show, they will create bold new prototypes of shape-shifting boats ready for water tests. It's going to be a very special weekend of open innovation and creative engineering, and we warmly invite you back on Saturday and Sunday to see them work. We're at a point in human history where we cannot merely afford to minimize the damage done to our ecosystems through climate change and the loss of the planet's biodiversity. As the title of tonight's event suggests, net zero impact is not enough. Instead, we need to implement net positive solutions that regenerate our natural, economic, and social systems. The key to this lies with us, you and me. Each one of us has the agency and capability to enact the change that we want to see. One way that we can act change is to draw on regenerative design. This form of design acknowledges that our built infrastructure exists within a natural environment. Regenerative designers imagine structures that are aligned with our societal needs and operate in harmony with the natural environment. Regenerative design, therefore, works towards a future where we begin to heal the environmental damage we've done to our environment through shared action. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this uh, from our two speakers uh, tonight, Sarah and uh, Caesar. So to introduce them and to begin tonight's event, let me welcome back Joshua Lau. Thank you, Anna. So let me introduce our first speaker for this, for this evening, which is none other than Art Science Museum's inaugural Art Scientist in Residence, Caesar John Harada. So Caesar is a Singapore-based French-Japanese designer, environmentalist, educator, and entrepreneur. With ongoing research and development on renewable energy sources and environmentally sustainable sea transport, his passion for impact innovation and climate crisis earth solutions has found a home for education and experimentation here at Art Science Museum. Caesar is currently an Associate Professor of Design at Singapore Institute of Technology and a candidate PhD in Design and Ocean Innovation at the National Conservatory of Arts and Crafts. In his presentation today, Caesar will be addressing the current status of the climate crisis or proposing positive systemic changes that could be adopted by the design industry to address the crisis. These include the inclusion of the younger generation and the implementation of open source research and science. Jumping off of this, Caesar will also be sharing his insights from the workshops he has held at Art Science Museum over the past few months. So let us put our hands together to welcome Caesar onto the stage. So thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the inaugural um, resident at the Art Science Museum. And so for, this is a really, really great honor. Um, actually, um, I've known Honor for many, many years. Uh, and also, I met uh, with Sarah before deciding to move here. And I gotta say that the existence of your institution is one of the reasons why I decided to move to Singapore. Because it gave me the confidence that I would find uh, kinship and people that I could discuss. And there are many people in this audience as well that have become friends. And I, that I'm really looking forward to cultivate uh, friendship and make many projects. So thanks so much for, for having me. And, especially giving us also a platform to bring my, my father, my wife, my son, and you know, be, be the family project for, for me. This is a, an, an event of um, uh, you know, uh, transition, give, giving and uh, passing the baton as well. So thanks so much. So uh, there are uh, four big parts. First, I'd like to talk about the problems that I think we are, that I'm focused on dealing with. I speak about the experiment that we're doing specifically uh, that we have done at the Art Science uh, Museum. Um, there's a lot of other projects that, I, of course, I would love to talk about, but the time is limited, so I'll, I'll stick to those. Uh, and then how I think we can position uh, ourselves as designer or artist uh, or change makers uh, for, for the climate, and how I invite each and one of you, even if you're not a designer, if you're not, uh, you know, whatever business uh, or, or activity you have, uh, to, to be engaged with. So the particular aspect that I'm uh, interested in for the context of this workshop is that the climate uh, change or climate crisis is going to affect mostly young people and indigenous people. 
young people because they're going to live through all those changes. So all the things that we do right now, they're going to live through for many, many years. And the indigenous people, because when sea level rise or when the environment is disrupted, uh, they are on the front line and they are the ones who suffer uh, the most and typically have the least resource. They, you know, they, they cannot easily move or buy their way outside, uh, out of, of the crisis. And uh, in particular, uh, the ocean, so the sea level rise I was mentioning, uh, and the coastal communities are going to be the most uh, impacted uh, by this. Um, you know, uh, just Libya last week, 20,000 people died because of flooding. Um, two weeks ago, the biggest uh, um, r black rain in Hong Kong. Um, you know, a month ago in South Africa, uh, two months ago in China, and so on and so on. So, uh, a lot of those areas are coastal, and they, they, they will suffer from, from those changes. But oftentimes, we forget that what is controlling this climate is the ocean. And so, the ocean is covering 70% of the surface of the planet and it's absorbing 90% of the heat from the sun because when the rays of the sun hit the planet, they basically get stored, this energy gets stored into the water and it's redistributed through the ocean currents. And so uh, this is really something that people forget is that also 75% of the oxygen we breathe is from the ocean, not from the trees. Uh, so the ocean is really the heart of the climate system uh, absorb most of the CO2 that we are producing, most of the excess heat that we are producing, and when we disturb the ocean, the cycles are very long. So what we do right now will come back to us in a thousand years or, or more. So even if we stopped uh, climate, our activities and impact on climate, the ocean will absorb it and it will give it back to us maybe you know, for the next few hundred years, because that's the, basically the sink of all this. In very practical terms, what does it mean uh, if the climate redistributes that heat and change the climate? It's already, uh, we already have tens of millions of refugees every year. We're talking about by 2050, uh, 1.2 billion refugees by the mid-century. We're talking about more than 2 billion by the end of the century. So that means that about more than one in five persons would have to be displaced, not in their own country, but they would have to go even across borders. So there's already a lot of internally displaced people, but we're talking about people who have to literally like, cross, uh, cross oceans oftentimes. And so the climate is uh, at the root cause, but uh, there are many, many consequences to it. Not only the climate changes, but it affects you know, our food, it affects the type of disease that can affect us, and eventually when there's you know, less natural resources, it can create wars. And you know, we are, um, yeah, I feel, I feel so bad for telling all those really negative things, but basically I'm setting up the stage for like why there's a sense of urgency, and why Asia in particular is so strategic. So 99 of the top 100 cities that will be most affected by climate change are in Asia for the simple reason that most people are in Asia uh, and most cities in Asia are coastal. Uh, so uh, being in Singapore, at the same time we are you know, very comfortable, but we're in an area that has a lot of problems. They're going to have an increasing number of problems. And if we are, have a bit of foresight, uh, we can use our advantage of being a very uh, developed uh, place to actually put ourselves to the service of the region and develop solutions for the region. So I think this is what we should do. And uh, the fact of talking about young people and indigenous people, so um, indigenous people are the people that contribute the most to environmental conservation. Yet, when there's carbon credits, for example, to be given, they are very, very rarely on the receiving end of those new mechanics, of those new economic systems that are putting up in place. And that Singapore wants to champion. So we're going to be paying people who are maybe large NGOs, but very rarely uh, indigenous people that do 80% of conservation work. And for young people, uh, this is a paper from the UN that recognizes that they are dramatically lacking uh, connection with the young people and their uh, expectations uh, for what they, what they hope for the future and how the planet should be managed. So, so there's a lot of work to do. So the approach that we are taking here is very uh, grassroots. How can we work with young people uh, to develop a climate solution? Maybe not to address like all the climates, but you know, specific topic. In 2010, uh, maybe you remember, the BP oil spill was in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a terrible catastrophe, uh, 11 people died on the spot, but uh, it was the worst environmental catastrophe in North America. And the pink face is the size of Singapore. <laughs> so you can imagine uh, the yellow being the oil. If it had reached uh, Singapore, Singapore would be completely under oil. Like it would, it would, you would still definitely uh, notice it today. 
So it was, it was a, a big uh, environmental catastrophe. Um, so I used to be a researcher at MIT, but the first time when I went to the Gulf of Mexico was to test this technology independently from my lab. And this is a, um, a fisherman that I met uh, while I was going to test our device. And you can notice he doesn't have legs. Reason is because uh, he lost his first leg during Katrina, during the, uh, during the uh, typhoon, hurricane. And because he was, you know, he needed to pay um, his boat. And so he was working overtime. And so during the, the hurricane, obviously, there's so many things rocking around. And one of his legs got caught into uh, some equipment, fell on his leg and just like crushed his leg. Then, uh, because he had two boats and some of his friends died in the other boats, so he was supporting his friend's family. And so after Katrina, he was, only has one leg left, but he was working day shift and also night shift. And one night, he was too tired, and his second leg got caught into a hoist, so the machinery that pulls the nets, and his second uh, leg got cut. And so I was asking him, you know, like, why is he even still working? And he was saying, well, because when you have an oil spill, you cannot go fish, so he can't go to fish anymore. And uh, the tourism industry is also destroyed, so he can't, you know, uh, work in the hospitality industry. So the only thing that was left for him is to clean up the oil. And I was asking him how I felt, and he was saying, well, what uh, saddens me is not the oil, it's because my best friend uh, just shot himself yesterday. And because uh, his best friend got sick, uh, trying to clean up the oil, that uh, made him sick. So uh, an environmental catastrophe is never just an environmental catastrophe. Eventually, it trickles down to destroy people's life. And in Singapore, we are sort of shielded. But eventually, when those uh, disasters keep happening, uh, it will trickle down to you know, our friends and family. So, so yeah, so this is very real, and yeah. So I was observing how oil was being collected, and I noticed that the fishing boat, with our shrimping boat they're using, were doing a, not a great job. They were basically eyeballing where the oil was going and trying to catch the oil. And so uh, I kept thinking, after I left uh, the lab, could we use the power of nature so the wind, the current, the wave, which is controlling the ocean, the, 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 the movements of the oil to capture the oil. So after I left the lab at MIT, where we're developing expensive closed source technology, I kept thinking, could we develop open source technology that are cheap and are using uh, natural uh, energy? And so I was iterating on many prototypes, all very cheap. This one is a, it's a hacked RC boat. It's a toy boat that you could buy as a toy. And I just hacked it, I put the rudder at the front. I was trying to control a long payload. Then I kept thinking and I started to publish my uh, research just online on websites like Instructables or some you know, social media, social, uh, Facebook, and get encouragement and feedback from people. And uh, this is some friends in Korea. They said, what about you put a rudder at the front and another one at the back? And we tried this to try to control the, the, the absorbent. And eventually, uh, we, with the, with this, with the uh, suggestion, I developed this shape-shifting boat. It's the first boat that changes shape. So the same way you can control the sail, this one you can control the hull. And that gives you much more control over the payload that you could drag. And so if you can control the payload, then you can sail up the wind and therefore sails towards the source of the, of the oil spill. So the idea is that you could basically use the energy of nature to capture a man-made catastrophe. So um, I was very excited about it, so I kept posting it on social media. And I was wondering whether this uh, technology had already been you know, uh, patent, patented. And I looked it up, and it wasn't patented. So I licensed it as an open hardware license, which was very new back then. So the CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, have this open source license. So if you develop a new technology, you can license it as open source. And because I thought maybe this has potential uh, to change how we sail, uh, I made this open source. And so suddenly there was an explosion. People in Brazil started to make their own versions of it. In Mexico, in South Africa, in, in China, people started to make their own version of the boat. And uh, always this with the spirit of doing everything very cheap. And eventually, we crossed sourced on Kickstarter, uh, so it was a very new back then. We were the second uh, technological project on Kickstarter back then. Uh, and we got enough money to rent a factory in the Netherlands uh, and to test, basically it's a three meter torpedo <laughs> that it can change shape with a, with a sail, and that we tested in, uh, in the port of Rotterdam. And so three meter of a uh, boat can uh, control 25 meters of payload. But anyway, so that was the, the research we were doing. 
since then, uh, NASA and Boeing are looking at using similar technology for uh, controlling uh, airplane wings and reducing uh, turbulences, increasing lift by up to 25%, reducing uh, energy consumption. So something that was studied in a garage to clean up oil spill is now going to be maybe the future of aviation and you know, making uh, airplanes safer. So many benefits of open source. So bringing this technology to the kids at the Art Science Museum, I just explained to them the, the basic physics, not by equation, but by showing them demos. So I show them some prototype, I show them the documentation, and I tell them, can we make this technology simpler? So for me, I, tapping in the uh, imagination of kids is, is a treasure. It's uh, when you talk to kids, you get so many more ideas than if you lock yourself in the lab with other MIT uh, grads, right? Like just kids, you give them like 10 minutes and they'll come up with so many ideas. And so the kids really uh, simplified uh, the technology a, a lot and they made the technology a lot more elegant and lightweight because they have less time and we're using simple materials. Uh, I'll go a bit faster because <laughs> I realize I'm really going long. For the ocean train, so based on the same idea uh, of the ship shifting, we're thinking, can we uh, improve how, say, shipping is done? Singapore is a huge shipping, one of the biggest shipping places in the world. Shipping is 90% of the world trade. And so um, we make the boats that are very, very big. Uh, the, uh, the, the, we, we're making them longer and longer. But actually, when they go to, from Asia to America, they transport a lot. When they come back, they tend to be half empty. So could we make boats the same way that we make freight trains? So the most energy we use in boats is to move the air, uh, in cars, sorry, they move the, move the air and the friction on the road. What if we could make uh, a boat like a train, so have it as a modular structure? So I, I made a couple of mechanical uh, devices to try the physics of it, and I just proposed this uh, principle to the students and asked them, could we do this uh, on the water? Uh, could we reduce amount, how much energy we use? And so the kids um, came up with this design, which blew my mind. I just told them, you only have one sheet of foam board per team, trying to carry as much weight as possible and create a design that would, could be modular. And the kids came up with this design. So uh, this is the, uh, the uh, one sheet of foam board can carry 25 kg of concrete. And that was 100% the kids' design. And so the kids compete against each other. Uh, and then this was the design that could carry the most on the first day. And so on the second day, all the other kids uh, essentially copied uh, this design and expanded it. And by the second day, we could carry 80 kg of concrete with five sheets of foam board and four fans, which are like, 20, like two, two watts each. So very, very little energy can carry a lot of weight. Uh, similar idea. Uh, we, we, I was asking, Singapore is this amazing port, and I asked the students, what is the traditional boat of Singapore? And nobody, I have, I have yet to meet one person who could tell me what the traditional boat of Singapore, because no, nobody knows, because there's not even one left from what I've researched. Just across uh, the, the, the strait, there are those amazing boats, they are called Kolek. And uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia, they're still practicing this craft. Those boats have evolved over thousands of years. We invented boats long before we invented the wheel. And so these boats have evolved in this region with the material, with the wind condition, with the current, the wave condition of here. So how could we lose thousands of years of evolution of naval architecture? So I'm very interested to bring this knowledge back. And so um, I, we, with the students, we, we, uh, we tried to design different uh, boats. And they came up with, again, like many, many different designs. Uh, you know, inspired from tradition, but also from you know, futuristic designs that maybe they, they see in cartoons or sci-fi. Uh, okay, time is running, so I'll, I'll go. Uh, uh, okay, the last one, this is a very ongoing research, and I want to keep the surprise because there is a really big development happening, which we'll be showing to you only when it's uh, a bit more mature. But with the students, we uh, built a, a version of floating solar but this time with also hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen is the energy of the future. I uh, did some early experiments in Hong Kong. I, I pr we produced with a local artist, uh, Kei Wong, this giant oyster. This giant oyster is an oyster hatchery. We are rebreeding millions of baby oysters in this floating structure and replanting them in the Pearl River Delta to fertilize the Pearl River Delta and bring the oysters that filter the water, build reefs, and create a habitat for uh, every other uh, animal. And so based on this small experiment, 
um, of producing hydrogen also on board so that we cannot so we can avoid using chemical batteries because when you have chemical batteries and there's a typhoon if your battery falls in the water it's it's an environmental disaster uh, we did this uh, experiment in Indonesia uh, last year uh, so in Indonesia we we proposed the vision what if every uh, household of fishermen coastal people could produce their own energy so if you're a fisherman and you are already spending so much money on your electricity bill, your petrol, and your gas for cooking, what if you could build yourself your own floating solar panel, but then you don't want to put a, a toxic battery in the sea if it drowns? So what if we inflated those balloons with hydrogen, and then every day after working, after fishing, catch back the hydrogen and bring it back to your home, and you could actually uh, use it? So we just this uh, we just did we just did this sorry as a speculative design experiment, uh, sort of thinking like you know future scenarios, but it turns out that we did more research and it'd be possible to provide enough cooking fuel and enough gas for lighting if you use LEDs for like a typical Indonesian family like a coastal uh, coastal community, and so we kept digging and uh, now we are looking to develop a much larger facility. So I can't talk to you much, too much about it, but that's that will be a surprise. The kids uh, did the same experiment. We teach them about basic electronics and solar and hydrogen and they immediately understand it and they build their own uh, version of it and they, they build those amazing devices that are self-propelled using hydrogen and solar concentrator and they are modular and that also blew my mind because in my mind it had to be like one uh, module but the kids came up with the idea that it could be many modules so they, they could be more e expandable um, and so yeah so now we are looking to develop a, a research facility um, in Indonesia okay so this is the point I'm trying to drive home is that if we want to solve climate change, we need to work with the people who are concerned the most by it. The young people and indigenous people, mostly. Because young people have the most creativity, which we need a lot of, and indigenous people have the most knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry, even if I study all the papers, and if I go to the mangrove, I would rather put my life in the hand of somebody who is a tribal <laughs> member than somebody with a PhD about mangrove, because they actually know the mangrove. Uh, and uh, the model that, of design that we're proposing is a shift in all those values that normally we think that the designer needs to be in control of the process, that we need to own the rights of the IP of you know, our beautiful designs, our precious uh, cre creation. Uh, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's counterproductive. I feel that if we, if we really want to solve this problem, we need to change the model because this current model will not allow us to work fast enough to address those climate uh, challenges. By the way, all the stuff that I showed you, you can find it online, and the kids also wrote the documentation on hackster.io, so if you want to build on top of their knowledge, you can. So it's all open science. And so uh, the final point that I want to do is this, is that we do not have the time not to share this knowledge. Um, and that's why I invite you to uh, get acquainted with open science, which I believe is, could be the foundation of you know, the shift in how we think about technology. Most AI projects already use open, open source, you know, most uh, blockchain technology use open source. So it's already happening, but we also need to do that with the hardware, with the, the, with the built environment. Um, and also, uh, net zero, to address, you know, the, the topic, is definitely not enough. Oftentimes, because also net zero, unfortunately, uh, is also a sort of post-colonial uh, activity. Uh, my brother is an environmental lawyer, and when they were debating this you know, 20 years ago, in the very beginning, uh, it was called the right to pollute. It was literally called the, the, the pay to pollute. That was the initial name of uh, carbon credits. Because basically people buy the right to emit carbon, and if they, can, if they, if they are going over their, their, um, their budget, then they can ask somebody else to, 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 to bear their, their capacity. I, I don't have the time to show you this, but I highly recommend you to watch this. It's a very short video made by uh, some in Indian uh, analysts, and they basically explain that, for example, India, which was colonized by the British, is now you have some British uh, investment fund and ask them to invest in their you know, carbon funds and to basically tell them you cannot develop because we want to you know, buy from you the carbon capacity, and so you, you shouldn't buy and shouldn't industrialize. So, also, I feel that this is something I need to say in Singapore is that I feel that oftentimes in, in a place like Singapore is very free market. I'm not anti-capitalist, but uh, oftentimes we, f we, we believe that the market is going to solve everything. 
but I don't believe that the, the market is going to solve everything fast enough. You know, the invisible hand does not care about your children. It does not care about the trees. Uh, the market is optimizing for money. It's not optimizing for the planet's survival. So I believe that we have, that's why also museums are so important. That's why culture is so important. In the past, there were a lot of things that we, we, when, we, when it was back then, we think it was normal. If you go back 250 years ago, slavery was normal. And if you are against slavery, a lot of people say you are unpatriotic, you are a traitor to your country, you know, because you, are, you want to slow down economic progress. Or uh, if you are uh, in China, you know, if you are against you know, the fact that women are treated in this way, maybe you, have, you, know, you, know, somebody, you, you, you would have a lot of enemies if you raise your voice. Even if, to, even if today we know, we look at it and we think it's wrong, back then it was a social, no, a social norm. So I know that to change our behavior in how we consume, in how we transport, in how we do everything, it takes a lot of courage. But I'm sure that in your heart you, can, you know what is the right thing to do. But it takes a lot of courage. And, and, and I hope that by getting together and by encouraging each other, uh, we can find this courage you know, to not uh, be like everybody else and, and, to, and to be willing to stand out. Because uh, ecocide, which is happening today, is not, is not normal. And so we see it all around us all the time. And so we should, we should, we should uh, sharpen our senses and our critical uh, eyes to, uh, to detect it and then to change it every, every time we can. I also see young, a lot of young people, and I was myself included, are becoming radicalized. We have all this sense of urgency. Uh, I used to be very much on the protesting uh, side. Of course, it's not possible to protest in Singapore. But uh, I think we have to be on the proposition side. I invite you to channel your energy to make proposition, not to you know, be uh, only against. Of course, we have to be against a lot of things, but it would be even more effective if we are proposing uh, alternatives. And so the uh, shift, I think for designer in particular, sometimes we have the uh, perception that you know, God is a designer, or this kind of like discourse, which I think is very dangerous. I think we have to be very humble in front of the complexity and the size of the challenge that we have, and design, in my opinion, are at the service of society to, uh, to affect those changes and to be part of that you know, uh, radical uh, uh, change. Yes, I need to finish. And so this is the, the shift that I'm proposing you, is that um, the design not to be uh, egoist, but to be egotist, but to be, uh, be, being about ecology, ec ecological. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caesar, for that really insightful sharing. If you want to see these slides, they are actually open source. You can scan the QR code and you can download and reuse all the material. Thank you, Caesar. So I would now, now like to introduce our next speaker for this evening, which is none other than Sarah Ishioka. So Sarah is an urbanist, strategist, curator, and writer who also leads Desire Lines, a strategic consultancy for environmental and social cultural initiatives based in Singapore. Through her practice, Sarah aims to design systems that are desired by its users and can support the growth of these communities in the future. Through efforts such as organizational transformation, program redesigns, consultancy for diversification and inclusivity, Sarah is hoping to inculcate a greater awareness of the individual in relation to our larger ecosystem. Amongst many accolades, Sarah has been recognized as a World City Summit Young Leader. She's an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects and she sits on the International Advisory Board of Art Science Museum. In her presentation today, Sarah will be, del be delving into regenerative design, culture and development. She will be sharing her insights into the possibilist mindset, discussing how the individual can enact actualized change to move our society towards a regenerative future. So let us welcome C uh, Sarah to the stage. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Yay, everyone's still awake. Uh, thanks, Joshua, for that introduction and to the whole ASM team for the invitation. And thanks, everyone, for spending your Friday evening with us. 
That was such an amazing presentation. Um, but I don't know if anyone else is feeling a little bit like you've just watched everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> um, so maybe I thought we could take a breath together um, and in the luxury of a physical gathering like this one, maybe we could think about grounding in space and time before we step into conversation. We can think about feeling the ground beneath our feet. And we're sitting here in the heart of the design miracle that is Marina Bay. This place enfolds Singapore's water story, its city in a garden, now city in nature story, its tourism story, its global business hub story, its centralized long-term planning story, all at once. And of course, we're inside the Art Science Museum, uh, which enfolds Singapore's relationship with culture and technology. So it's no wonder that media producers around the world love to use this skyline as shorthand for the future. However, as with people, with all of us, places have their shadow sides. And for Singapore, that's arguably an economic base of extractive industry alongside hyperconsumerism. We're also just opposite. And many of those in the room may know Singapore ranks 27th out of 142 countries in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions per capita. And while 40% of primary emissions come from power generation, over 44% of emissions come from industry. According to the Economic Development Board's website, quote, Singapore's powerful mix of refining, olefins production, and chemicals manufacturing business and innovation capabilities has made it one of the world's leading energy and chemical hubs. Is it unfair to highlight this? After all, Singapore is undertaking significant efforts to green its economy. And according to the two-year-old Green Plan, Jurong Island will apparently become a sustainable energy and chemicals park by 2030. The nation also aims to develop itself into a sustainable tourism destination, a carbon services hub, and a center for green finance." End quote. According to a government statement, the green economy aims to seek green growth opportunities to create new jobs, transform industries, and harness sustainability as a, quote, competitive advantage. Other initiatives include strengthening Singapore as a location to develop new sustainability solutions for Asia through R&D. New technologies for carbon capture, use, storage, the potential of low carbon hydrogen, and other emerging technological approaches to decarbonization. And this uh, is probably unsurprising given Singapore's insulation, as Caesar has mentioned, from the most immediate effects of climate destabilization that are plaguing the rest of the region and much of the planet and is bolstered by a history of successful mastery of environmental conditions. So these green growth plans generally take a techno-optimist approach to global challenges, but arguably one that's less progressive than the one we've just heard from Caesar. On the other hand, many Singaporeans think that we can do better than this, including those who will be gathering in Hong Lim Park tomorrow for the annual SG Climate Rally. The organizers of the rally, in their own words, call for more transparency and ambitious goals in Singapore's plan to transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewables. They want to see more robust and transparent environmental laws and procedures to protect and restore Singapore's, and I love that they use this word, Singapore's precious ecosystems. They appeal for meaningful engagement with the broader public especially low-income communities and workers in sunset industries in developing climate action strategy and initiatives. So this is the shifting ground beneath our feet. Then let's zoom out uh, from city-state to our entire planet, our only home. Conceived by the Stockholm Environment Institute, the planet, planetary boundaries model depicts aspects of our global systems that regulate our planet's stability, and thus livability for species like ours, which evolved to thrive under certain particular conditions. 
And just last week, you may have seen the news, researchers revealed that six of these nine planetary boundaries have now been breached, caused by our human activities. But you might ask, how are we faring as a species? Maybe the exploitation and de destabilization of the Earth can be justified because it's provided for all of our needs. Now the donut, a now pretty famous model designed by economist Kate Rayworth, illustrates the simple but compelling idea that there's a safe and just operating space for humanity which lies between the social foundation, meaning all the things like life expectancy, nutrition, access to energy, access to education, that we can consider fundamental human rights, and the ecological ceiling, those planetary boundaries we just talked about. Last year, another group of researchers mapped our progress against the donut between 1992 and 2015, which is the last time all, all data was available. And we can see that ecological overshoot has not done much to help those social shortfalls. So where do we, we want to go from here? The Planetary Boundaries Report warns that, quote, human activities are increasing the risk of triggering dramatic changes in overall Earth conditions. And I think it's important to emphasize climate is a huge challenge, but that's not the only challenge that we face. And sometimes this will even tell you that's not the most important one to deal with triggering dramatic changes in overall Earth conditions that decrease the planet's ability to support modern civilizations. In other words, we're on a path of breakdown. And there's a reform path which tinkers within existing systems rather than revolutionizing them. This might, just to cite one possible example, might look at investment in carbon neutral aviation fuels rather than a reduction in flight frequency or maybe curbs on private planes at Celatar. And many of the efforts showcased at events like Ecosperity are not like Caesars. They're more arguably aligned with a reform approach. And I'm sure you can think of other examples. These only slow our path to breakdown. But meanwhile, others, like Caesar, maybe like some of the folks at Singapore Climate Rally, are calling for transformative change. So what does it look and feel like to design and then live into the future we want? What transformations must we bring about? And these are questions that my co-author Michael Pollan and I explore in our book Flourish, Design Paradigms for Our Planetary Emergency, which I've been invited to revisit this evening. Like an increasing number of our peers, probably many of you in the room, Michael and I believe that the, that the changes required to meet our moment involve collective transformation at a paradigm or mindset level, not just technical solutionary. And we can start with how we think about sustainability. Conventional framings and applications of sustainability have clearly been insufficient, or we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. Most sustainable initiatives have as others have mentioned, aim to minimize harm to living systems rather than maximize benefits to them. And in design, the vast majority of what currently gets built is below the line of neutral impact. I'd like to uh, tip my hat to Bill Reed of the Regenesis Group for giving us his blessing to reproduce this essential diagram. It's been copied many times. You may well have seen other versions of it, but unfortunately it often goes unattributed. So where's Singapore on Bill's diagram? You might argue that Singapore is at green with the majority of its buildings, with some elements of restorative when it comes to aspects of its approach to landscape, as in coral reef restoration, or in the very remarkable large-scale tree planting campaigns. The most ambitious mainstream plans aim for net zero. These include some of the new buildings on university campuses and the headline pledges you'll hear from some corporations. But we still need to remember that that's only 100% less bad. <laughs> In the words of circular economy guru William McDonnell. And often if we look closer, we can find that net zero is applied only in one or maybe two dimensions, carbon neutral, plastic neutral, you may have heard, 
may be water or energy self-sufficient. And these are good steps in themselves, but they often lack a holistic view of our multidimensional crises. Remember, we've already overshot two-thirds of our planetary boundaries. But at the top of Bill's diagram, we find regenerative design and development. And this is a word you may have heard cropping up more and more frequently in design conversations. And I did a quick look through the website, and I reckon at least 20% of the events for this year's Singapore Design Week mention the term, which is really exciting. But when vocabulary changes, it's important for those of us who aim for transformation to expect accountability for behavior to also change. So in my view, definitions and characterizations matter. They're not just academic. So Bill Reed and his long-term collaborator, Pamela Meng, offer the following definition of regenerative design. And it's a mouthful, but it's important, so let's try to listen to it. Regenerative design is a system of technologies and strategies based on an understanding of the inner working of ecosystems that generates designs to regenerate rather than deplete underlying life support systems and resources within socio-ecological holes. In Flourish, Michael and I define it a bit more concisely, but maybe a bit grandiosely, um, as that which supports the flourishing of all life for all time. But maybe an even simpler way to put it now is a regenerative approach puts life at the center of every decision that we make. And in Flourish, we describe five key mindset shifts that, in our view, characterize a regenerative approach. But tonight, uh, the ASM team have asked me to focus on just one of these, uh, which is key to unlocking action. Now, audience participation. Can I have a show of hands? How many in the room tonight consider yourselves optimists? Could you raise your hand? How many optimists do we have in the room? Great, thank you. Okay, hands down. How many of you, those here consider yourself pessimists? Hands up. Optimists have slightly, oh, there are a lot of pessimists in the back row. <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, let's return to this sobering prospect. We are on the path to break down unless we make a transformative leap. Faced with our situation, an optimist might say, don't worry. New technologies, say nuclear fusion, are just around the corner, and those will save us. Or we can relax. Our leaders are smart, they're strong, they have a plan to solve this. Whereas a pessimist might say, are you crazy? The situation is bad, it can only get worse. There's nothing I can do about it. The system's broken, the guys in power are inept, and we should just resign ourselves. It's basically game over. But the problem with both of these stances is that they imply a certain inevitability about the future. As Rebecca Solnit writes, whether you feel assured that everything is going to hell or will all turn out fine, you are not impelled to act. So what approach might we choose instead? Michael and I like the term possibilism, which was coined by Hans Rosling, the statistician and public health advocate. And in our use, a possibilist mindset or worldview integrates the possibility of action despite uncertainty. And there's a crucial distinction we'll need to make here between probable and possible futures. So, if current trends continue, the probable future looks grim. But that's all the more reason for us to use our skills to chart a different course towards possible futures. A possibilist acknowledges the complexity of the many choices that have led us to this moment. But rather than assuming that our path can only follow one direction from here forward, they understand that many paths are still open to us if we choose to make and take them. A possibilist understands the power of creativity to imagine the world we do want 
to motivate us to realize it. As with the young artist who entered the Create for Climate Art Competition, which Desire Lines ran as one of our pro bono projects in 2019. A possibilist understands that to change everything, we need everyone to be actively engaged in the effort. And for me, this is where the relevance of design and other creative industries come to the fore. We're trained to envisage and manifest reality. A possibilist looks with clear eyes at the spaces and systems we've inherited and acts to transform them to be future ready, as with Edible Garden City, who transforms the rooftops of Singapore's buildings into permaculture farms and have inspired many other businesses to do so. A possibilist also seeks to expand their own agency, both individual and collective, to bring about the future they want. And one of our motivations for writing Flourish was to counteract the trend we witnessed in some of architecture and design's biggest stars to minimize their own agency and thus minimize their responsibility towards addressing global challenges. Fortunately, this is becoming much less common, although a fair number of public figures still fall back on the unfortunate habit of protesting about limitations rather than pushing forward with all of the actions that are within their reach. So for an individual, this might, might start with considering our spheres of influence. This is an exercise we love to run at DL, where we, you know, I might start from myself, then I think about my immediate family, my extended family, my colleagues or school peers, my neighbors, the businesses I frequent, the politicians I vote for, and so on. These are all communities I can influence. And as a side note, our capacity to influence positive transformation also benefits tremendously by doing internal work to understand ourselves better and learning healthy ways of interacting with others, but that's a whole different talk. Um, for organizations, possibilism and expanded agency can manifest in the kind of shifts identified by Forum for the Future in their latest Future of Sustainability report. I don't have time to go into depth, but I strongly um, recommend everyone download and read the report, it's brilliant. And both individuals and organizations should consider their position in relation to the many other agents within their ecosystems. In DL's work, we often encourage our clients or partners to map out where they sit in relation to others and the flows of energy between and amongst them. Because Apostolus asks, what solutions already exist here? And we heard from Caesar how indigenous thinking and practice inspires him. I totally agree. This means understanding endemic environmental conditions of the places we find ourselves in and the cultural practices that have arisen over generations of reciprocal coexistence between humans and the rest of nature. And in Singapore's context specifically, this should start with, by working with members of the indigenous Orang Lawak community many of whom are active in programs of cultural revival. So, and I am wrapping up, Jillian. When we start a project, we always ask, what solutions already exist? And how can we contribute to and amplify them? This helps to avoid the pitfalls of startup culture, or at least, at least as it's often practiced, which tends to conflate innovation with degenerative paradigms of disruption and competition, quite butch paradigms, rather than say evolution and co-creation. And in Singapore today, we are lucky to have a wide range of organizations and initiatives that are charting positive paths forward, which we can join, learn from, and help to develop. So what does this all mean for you? And I'll close with this because it's one of the most frequent questions I get after my talks, which is, well, what should I do? And what you should do might look like joining the rally tomorrow if you're legally allowed to, um, or if you're an introvert, it might mean writing to your elected representatives, or if you're keen to make a difference on your doorstep, you could get involved in local community initiatives. But if you want to be more precise about deciding where to start, I love this diagram from scientist and activist Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who asks you to consider what work needs doing, what are you good at, and what brings you joy. So start there. 
Rather than seeing the future as something that happens to us, we need to decide the future we want and then set about creating it. And I'm excited to hear your questions, either in discussion now um, or afterwards. You can find my contact details. Thank you, Sarah. If you could just take a seat to the stage and Siza and I will join you for a time of Q&A. So now that we've heard from both Siza and Sarah, um, we'll be engaging in a time of Q&A. I am aware of the time, so we will be taking a few questions from the audience. But while you guys are all gathering your thoughts, I will start off the conversation with the two of you. So both of you speak so greatly of the powers of community and I wanted to know in your own experiences how do you balance the role of the individual and the role of community in collaborative design? Um, I think there, there's, a, there's a difficult balance to achieve because even if you have a community there's always somebody who has to be sort of driving the, the process and so often time like if let's say if you turn out to join a community and there's always already somebody who is doing this community then sometimes you feel that you know maybe if you, even if it's an open community you feel maybe you can't make much decision for example let's say that's one scenario or if you are the one who is driving this community you might feel very lonely or you might feel that you're a bottleneck to that community and so i think it's um i think it's the, the community ideally should be about the mission of the community and discussing with the other members so that you can support each other so that if w one day you are tired you know you can give it to somebody else or somebody else also know that they can rely on you uh, there's uh, so much um, merit for being the first follower or being the person who you know keeps showing up uh, so it's not about creating something new but again like if you can join something that already exists usually it's it's a better use of, of energy yeah. thank you Cesar um, Sarah your thoughts yeah I agree with Thanks. Um, I completely agree with that. And also, I think this is where it's really important to, to talk about the internal work and the interpersonal work. I think that every design course, or really like every, every educational program should include this sort of work, because so many processes can break down when we, if we don't know ourselves well enough, or if we haven't learned th things like nonviolent communication, or how to take collective decisions. We're just, you know, taught completely how to navigate a traditional hierarchical system. Um, so for me, that's absolutely fundamental, that sort of taking the time to do that work on ourselves as individuals, and then understanding how to relate in a positive, regenerative way to others within the group. Thank you for that, Sarah. All right, so I would like to open up the f it to the floor for questions. If you could just raise your hand, yep, a colleague of mine. Hello, um, my name is Stefan. So uh, I'm curious about uh, some of the threats I've been seeing. Um, so um, as a design researcher myself, um, I'm actually um, curious if you have explored certain synergies between, um, say, um, uh, uh, regenerative design and also uh, salutogenic design, design for health and well-being. So what are some of the intersections that you see uh, around the globe? And also on the flip side, understand that um, there are a lot of ways of working that need to be addressed. For example, silos. So um, people, we tend to work in silos in terms of, hey, healthcare is healthcare, defense is defense, and you know, um, green is green. So how do you go about breaking these silos? I can recommend a fantastic book called Inflamed, which actually isn't a design title, but it makes a very compelling, it's a doctor and a journalist writing together, it makes a compelling case for how our individual health is fundamentally interlinked with the health of our communities, which is fundamentally interlinked and embedded in the health of our environments. Um, and I think that that's, that's really the only way to think about it, right? We can't think about human health as isolated from, individual health as isolated from community health and ecosystems health. So uh, on a very similar vein, um, there is uh, some literature I was reading recently because at, at SIT, in our university, we have to, um, we're doing this exercise right now of trying to figure a way to uh, measure the impact of our work. 
And um, so we want to move away from just you know, publication and citation because that's not really representative of the good that we can do in the world. And so as I was looking at different like, uh, evaluation model, the one that I was most inspired is similar to what you're discussing. It's called planetary health. Uh, and so the idea is that our health is just one small unit of a, of a bigger one. And um, I think it takes some time to uh, bring this model of ev evaluation to our leaders and that they start to adopt this uh, model. Uh, but I think there are baby steps where we can take, you know, like starting to break down, for example, the impact into social, environmental, uh, economic and cultural impact. So this is the sort of middle ground that we have found for now. Uh, and I think eventually we want to sort of graduate from that and go towards planetary health. But I think it's, uh, it, it can sound too lofty, for example, some, for some discipline, you know. Uh, so I think it's one step at a time, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, is there any other questions? Maybe the gentleman right here. Thanks. Um, hi. Um, can I ask, how do you balance um, in design the, uh, you know, between aesthetics and functionality mm -hmm. and also the economic um, cost associated with realizing this uh, regenerative design? A any comments on that? Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I cannot reveal too much about the, the next project yet, but uh, I'm working on exactly finding this, uh, this, this balance. Uh, so I'm working on trying to find a way to produce green hydrogen in an ecological way, and in which way that the governance and the sort of the, the money, the benefits, would go, you know, and benefit mostly the community, which is very different from most energy company that tend to be more extractive, right? So, uh, I, I mean, in my case, it's a work in progress. Maybe we've done it uh, with Abby over there on the education level. Uh, we built a, an organization called Maker Bay. Uh, initially, we, want, we, we structured it as a social enterprise. But after almost uh, eight years of operation, we realized that it was better as a non-profit structure, but it's doing very well as a non-profit structure. So, I mean, as you describe, it's always you have to find a balance. And in our case, the way we did it is that we had a core activity, which was a maker space, and but then we diversified a portfolio of activity. We go into fabrication, we go into R&D, we go into uh, designing events or exhibits, and then we, we balance those different activities. So it's generally not so much about the singular product, but more about building a system or building like a, a, a holistic business that I, I could find that I could, that I could balance. Uh, not in a design capacity, but in an advisory business capacity, we about 20 to 25 percent of our annual billable hours go to pro bono or low bono projects. And if there are any NGOs in the room, um, we'll we'll be relaunching this scheme early next month. Uh, but essentially, the work from our fully um, market rate based clients goes specifically to subsidize and support the development of civil society organizations who don't have the same means to pay. And we think that that's a really nice way of building the ecosystem uh, more broadly and being really transparent with all of our different types of clients how the system works. But maybe just to add, maybe if you're asking specifically about the aesthetics, uh, personally, I feel like I've sort of not given up on the design aspect, but more like uh, uh, give the, the last decision more and more to the community. And uh, so that means that I would work closely with the community and co-design with them, or letting them more and more decide what is the, what's the uh, final outcome. And so at the end, sometimes I feel like my old self is like, ah, oh, it's not exactly how I wish it would lo be looking like. But then typically the community uh, is so much more proud and adopts the design that we co-produce more because they are also the parent of that design. So, and then when I see the reaction, I feel so much more happier because at the end of the day, I don't do it for me, I do it for them. So I shifted my sort of satisfaction to be the satisfaction for me, to be the satisfaction for, of my client or community. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe we have time for just one last question. Maybe the lady right there. Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Emily Sharp. I'm um, visiting, uh, and thank you for having me, from Fiji and the Pacific. So a lot of uh, what you've been speaking about is really resonating. But something that struck me is what are you, what, in what ways are you also thinking about cultural safety when respecting and leaning into indigenous ways of knowing and being? I absolutely agree, the centrality, but I am also really cognizant that as we seek to decolonize, we can also inadvertently recolonize. <laughs> Um, and I'm really keen to hear about how you are considering that because I think we all need to be having these collective conversations. Thanks. I couldn't agree more and I think it really has to be an Indigenous-led process where these communities are actively inviting uh, non-Indigenous collaborators in and that they get to determine the terms of what that engagement is and I'm really happy that I know that multiple people are working on trying to think how you can structure non-extractive um, relationships, but that also fundamentally acknowledge that there does need to be some sort of energy exchange, right, of the knowledge. If there's gonna be knowledge transfer, there also has to be a reciprocal transfer of the resources. So um, I, I'll tell you about the, the things that I'm doing right now. So I'm working right now a lot in Indonesia, in Bali. And you know there's a long history of colonization there, right? So 300 years of Dutch occupation, some time with the Portuguese, then they had the Japanese occupation, it was very brutal. Um, and I'm half Japanese, so also definitely acknowledge that when I interact with them. Uh, and uh, the island where I'm working specifically uh, during the Suharto uh, dictatorship, uh, the villager, indigenous people were uh, displaced at gunpoint. So the people I'm talking to were moved off their home when they were children at gunpoint. And so now they live in a concentrated uh, village and uh, the area that used to be uh, their, 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 their identity, their culture, their livelihood is being developed as a luxury uh, resort. And so uh, it's very painful for them to tell me those stories. And for me, what I'm doing is I, I I, you know, like typically we would think like the, the job as a designer is not to do this, all this anthropologic work, but I completely disagree. Like I think that's completely my work to do that. So I spend a lot of time listening to the stories of the elders and also of the younger one. How, how, how does this story go through the generation? Because we're talking about multi-generational trauma. And um, what's happening now is that uh, there's a risk to uh, fall, to become a completely an ally, and to be uh, fighting aside with them against a common enemy. That's something that is kind of easy to fall into, because when you want to be uh, non-colonial, you could also become anti-colonial. And then you could go into a dynamic that is not very uh, constructive. And so um, there's, there's a lot of literature about the peace process and reconciliation, and so, uh, Again, like this is really expanding what I, what, I, what I would normally do as a designer, but I have to learn about this peace process. Uh, you know, the learnings from Rwanda or you know, so many places that had genocide or what's happening right now with the Rohingya. Uh, you know, like, basically, like, is, to, is to design for reconciliation. Can you make a platform that the powers that be, that are oppressors, if you will, can tolerate or they can see as a reaching hand you know, from the indigenous people, but still in a position where they are not uh, uh, reaching up, but when they can reach equal. Can we create uh, something that uh, flattens the playing field? Uh, so that's, that's, that's the sort of uh, way that I can think we can, uh, we can rebalance this, uh, this uh, colonial, colonized uh, dynamic by creating a playing field where the colonized have suddenly regain power because they have access to new technology, because they have access to knowledge, because they have economic opportunity. Um, so th that's how I, I would like to position uh, my work. Thank you. I mean, just, I'm really conscious of time, so we do have to wrap this up. Thank you to the audience for the questions. Um, maybe just to end it off, you know, both of you speak um, so m with such hope and such an outlook for a positive future. So maybe in just one sentence you could sort of give us an advice to people on how they can stay positive for this, this hopeful change that both of you are envisioning for us, yeah. 
<laughs> For me, it would be, uh, it's, ne it's never too small and it's never too late for, for you to, to try to do something, whatever it is. I spent all last week in Manila, which was amazing, and there was so much positive, proactive energy to make change in the design community there, way more than I witness here in Singapore. And this is in the face of way, way, way more challenges on whatever metric you want to look at. Um, so I think to, to quote Solnit again, I mean, despair is an absolute luxury. It's really, despair is for spoiled brats, in my opinion, and we have an absolute imperative to act in, the, in, a, in a way that gives us joy. Thank you both. So with that, I would like to end today's Q&A here. I would like to extend both mine and the museum's gratitude to Caesar and Sarah for being here with us this evening. If we could put our hands together to thank them. So before I fully close off this session, I just wanted to make a short announcement. Um, as Anna mentioned in the introduction, we are currently having an ongoing small exhibition for Caesar's Arts and Residency titled Ocean Imagineers Work Studio. So this showcase is currently open at level 3 and it's free for admission during museum hours till 1st of October. And we're actually having a really special gallery activation tomorrow and Sunday from 2pm to 5pm where Caesar himself will be with his father and his son building what I've heard is a 10 meter long boat. 12. 12. So that's really exciting. Surprise! <laughs> So hopefully all of you can join us there. Um, and with that, I just want to end today's program. I'd like to thank all of you for being here with us this evening. Um, you may make your way out of the museum by taking the list down to level one. And I wish you all well, and I hope to see you soon at the museum again. Thank you. Thank you.